that horrendous debate performance by Donald Trump signal the beginning of the end? I mean, he's got the stupid comments uh, that uh, he's made about the uh, Miss Universe winner uh, dogging her out, and that was a double whammy because number one, she was a woman, number two, she was Hispanic. He disparaged her. Uh, he reversed course and uh, claimed that Lester Holt uh, basically uh, screwed him. He said his mic uh, didn't work, and uh, his kids, who are probably actually running the campaign, they're all pissed off about the current leadership, so that means they're pissed off at Bannon and uh, Kellyanne Conway. So if those two uh, now jump ship, uh, I'm wondering what's going to happen. But uh, the latest is the fact that people within his own campaign are basically ratting them out, uh, trying to cover their own asses, though um, there are no official uh, named uh, sources to, uh, to the information that they're leaking. The information they're leaking is pretty good. Here you go with uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. Well, tonight the rats are swimming away from the sinking ship and they are swimming straight to the New York Times. Trump campaign staffers are now anonymously, anonymously leaking big time to the New York Times and other reporters about what a nuthouse it is inside the Trump campaign. One source told NBC News' Katie Turr that the debate was, quote, a disaster. That source said that Donald Trump's children are not happy with the campaign's leadership of Kellyanne Conway, Stephen Bannon, and David Bossie. These Trump campaign sources, who are leaking to reporters about how bad things are inside the Trump campaign, are still taking their campaign paychecks. Capitalism presents us all with a challenge, and that is what we won't do for money. What legal thing will we not do for money, no matter how much they pass? A lot of people don't want anything to do with the cigarette business, for example. Some people have seen enough alcoholism that they don't want anything to do with the booze business, don't want to be near it. And I've never inherited anything and never will, but I might have inherited something from my father if he had followed his friend's suggestion and invested in a liquor store in Boston where liquor stores do very, very well. But he couldn't do it. He'd seen alcohol kill too many people, he just couldn't do it. And in politics, and in this case, in Republican politics, the thing that most campaign professionals in Republican politics could not do for money, would not do for money, is work on the Donald Trump campaign. And that's why the Donald Trump campaign has the most inexperienced crew that we've ever seen in, in presidential campaign politics. And now that collection of unprofessionals who joined the Trump campaign only because of the money, that gang that you see lying and constantly interrupting on cable news every day is now whispering to reporters about the disaster that they are getting paid to participate in. The New York Times reports this about the anonymous Trump campaign sources. They were privately awash in second guessing about why he stopped attacking Mrs. Clinton on trade and character issues and instead grew erratic, impatient, and subdued as the night went on. They expressed frustration and discouragement over their candidate's performance Monday night. They blamed the large number of voluble people on his prep team, including two retired military figures with no political background. And they blamed the lack of time spent on preparing a game plan in the first place. These are campaign aides who are all working with the media now to absolve themselves of blame for Donald Trump's horrible performance in the debate and ultimately to absolve themselves of blame if Donald Trump loses in November. The sources named retired Army generals Michael Flynn and Keith Kellogg as the two most useless people who wasted Donald Trump's time in debate prep. The sources revealed that Roger Ailes tried to get Donald Trump to focus on debate prep, but he couldn't. And so then he just sat around telling 
political war stories from campaigns of yesteryear. The anonymous sources reveal that Rudolf Giuliani, quote, took over much of the preparation efforts by the end. That is, of course, their way of blaming Rudolf Giuliani for Donald Trump's failure in the debate. One aide told the New York Times that Donald Trump did not seem to pay attention during the practice sessions, which should come as no surprise to anyone who has heard Tony Schwartz describe Donald Trump's mental capacity. Remember, Tony Schwartz co-authored Donald Trump's first book, The Art of the Deal. Tony, Tony Schwartz spent day in and day out with Donald Trump for a couple of years, knows him very well, knows the way his twisted mind works. And last month, Tony Schwartz tweeted this. He said, Trump isn't preparing for debates because he can't. No attention span, deep ignorance about, about issues. He will be all bluster, no substance. Tony Schwartz, right again about Donald Trump. Donald Trump went to work today within the Trump media world, which of course means Fox News, to try to clean up the damage from the debate. Here he is tonight with his campaign coach, Bill O'Reilly. I'm Hillary Clinton in the next debate, and I say to you what she said yesterday in North Carolina. Hey, if he's not going to pay any taxes and he thinks that's smart, what does that make us? We pay taxes. Are we stupid? How are you going to answer that? Well, first of all, first of all, I never said I didn't pay taxes. She said, maybe you didn't pay taxes. Right. And I it's said, well, that would make me smart because tax is a big payment. But I think a lot of people say that's the kind of thinking that I want running this nation. Okay. A new NBC poll out today shows a majority of likely voters say Hillary Clinton won the first presidential debate. It shows 52% say Hillary Clinton won the debate, 21% say Donald Trump won the debate, 26% say neither candidate won the debate. Joining us now, David Korn, Washington bureau chief for Mother Jones and an MSNBC political analyst, also with us, Katie Packer, Republican strategist, former deputy campaign manager for Romney 2012, and an MSNBC contributor. And Katie, uh, uh, we know what you won't do for money. Uh, you would not <laughs> work on or support the Trump campaign in any way. But we've and we've seen this before when campaigns uh, hit the rough spot. But I've never seen anything quite like this outpouring in the last 24 hours of unnamed Trump campaign staff uh, pointing fingers inside the campaign about who's to blame for such a disastrous debate. Uh, do, do you imagine this is going to continue with that staff? Well, I would imagine that it will continue because he, he has sort of a collection of uh, misfit toys uh, over there running the campaign right now. And so there's not a lot of allegiance, there's not a lot of loyalty to the candidate or to one another. Um, it is sort of unprecedented to see in a general election campaign, um, you know, people literally turning on each other at this stage. Um, it's not something that I saw happen on our campaign in 2012, on the McCain campaign, the Obama campaign. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, in, in my lifetime, I've never really seen this kind of like backbiting and turning on each other. And I, you know, I'm no defender of Donald Trump, but he's not being served well by a team that's really just um, undermining him after a really uh, miserable performance on Monday night. And David, one of the things we're seeing in this reporting is clearly that these people have not figured out how to communicate with Donald Trump directly in a way that's effective. And so some of them are kind of betting that when yeah. he sees this in the New York Times, <laughs> when he sees these reports, they might actually get through to him that he needs debate prep. How crazy is that? Well, let's say he was in the White House. Yeah. Mr. President, maybe you shouldn't blow up with that country and launch a nuclear war. No, I can't say that. I want to get the New York Times to say that to him. I mean, the bottom line here is that if you think you know more than the generals about ISIS, then you think you know more about everything. You don't have to prep. This is like a core of Donald Trump. He does believe he knows more than anything, anyone else. He does believe he's bigger, better, smarter than anyone else. And that is a what may be the fatal flaw of his candidacy. Uh, and there's no way, I mean, regardless of who's serving him, uh, that they can deal with that. They can't hide it. They can't smother it. It comes to the fore. He can't get through 90 minutes of acting like a normal human being. 
Uh, let's listen to what Bill O'Reilly uh, said to Donald Trump tonight. They asked him a real tough question about this whole Miss Universe thing. Uh, you know what, I'm, I'm just gonna let you hear Bill O'Reilly's really tough question <laughs> and Donald Trump's response. Do you have anything further to say on this Miss Universe thing? No, not much. I mean, look, I hardly know this person. This is a person 20 years ago. A lot of things are coming out about her. I'm not going to say anything. I couldn't care less. But it's somebody I don't know, don't know certainly very well. I saved her job because they wanted to fire her for putting on so much weight. And it is a beauty contest. You know, I mean, say what you want, Bill. I mean, they know what they're getting into. It's a beauty contest. And I said, don't do that. Let her try and lose the weight. Can you imagine I end up in a position like this? So that's the way it is. I really just don't know her. Uh, Katie Packer, how's he doing on solving that problem? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that if you're getting into a situation in a campaign where you're talking about a woman who was Miss Universe, by the way, yes. <laughs> she was so beautiful, um, you know, putting on weight, you're probably not winning a lot of votes. Um, most women at some point in their life have felt fat and didn't want to be called out on it by a man who, by any, by, by any, anybody's uh, evaluation, is not svelte and thin. Um, you know, I just don't think it's a winning strategy for him. These are the, the, the kinds of women he needs to win a general election. And I think that if they weren't already fleeing him in droves, then this week has sort of driven them away. So, David, there we see, we saw on the debate stage, this complete lack of preparation. Because when Hillary Clinton brought this up and told her story, told Alicia Machado's story, Donald Trump was shocked and kept saying to her, where'd you find that? Where'd you find that? Yeah. As if he was hearing it for the first time. Now he goes on Bill O'Reilly's 20, more than 24 hours later, 48 hours later, he's on Bill O'Reilly's show. And his campaign staff has come up with nothing for him to say in response to a complete softball open-ended question about it in which he could have said anything. And that campaign staff sent him out there with absolutely nothing helpful to say about it. Well, you're assuming that they did that they did that. It could well be that they try to talk to the man, and he said, "No, I know what I'm doing. I got this." I mean, the, the story of the Times. Well, David, that just that, that just means they're incompetent one way or the other. Either well, they well, came well, up, but they came up with no answer, or they are incapable of communicating with their candidate, which makes them a complete waste of time. Or and he is incapable of being communicated to. I mean, I'm not letting them off the hook because they're working with a man who shouldn't probably be near the nuclear button or anything else in which the uh, people's lives depend. And yet they're trying to make him look as good as possible. And they know that he doesn't seem to have the mental facilities, to, uh, the faculties, to deal with these, you know, with a 90-minute debate. He's not interested in facts. He's not interested in figures. The only thing that Donald Trump really seems to be interested in is Donald Trump. And he's happy to talk on his campaign rallies for hours on end about Donald Trump. But he doesn't talk about policy. He doesn't talk about substance. He can vent. He can be angry. He can attack. He can name call. But he can't talk about serious things. And then when he's, you know, even when, he, when Hillary Clinton said, you called Rosie O'Donnell a pig, his answer was essentially, yeah, she is. He can't understand how that comes across to not just women voters, but to everybody. He's, he's a th thug. And he can't stop himself. Well, he, he well, added... Lawrence, go, go ahead, Katie. Lawrence, the biggest problem is the only thing to say in this situation is, I'm sorry, I was unkind, and exactly. I regret the way I treated that girl. Exactly. And he's incapable of expressing any kind of regret or remorse over any of his actions, which makes him impossible to coach. Katie, when do you quit the campaign? I mean, when you, <laughs> when you read what these aides are saying in the New York Times, what they've told Katie Turr, you know, he's a disaster, we can't work with him, can't get through to him. At what point do you say, uh, I'm leaving, uh, I'm not doing you any good, uh, and whether it's because you're not listening to me or whether it's because you don't think my input is useful, I'm not doing you any good, I'm not taking this paycheck under honest circumstances, I'm not helping in any way, I'm leaving. I mean, when do you quit What in, in a situation with a candidate like this? Well, I think, I think, you know, most people have already passed that point, and some of those people have quit. But if you look at the payday that Corey Lewandowski got, yeah. um, there are a lot of people that, that couldn't make that money anyplace else. And so they'll stick around. A lot of these people aren't really in demand and haven't been in demand. And that's why we haven't ever heard of them or seen them in presidential campaigns in the past. 
Um, so I, I do think that they'll stick it out here for a few more weeks, but a lot of them are in real jeopardy of being sort of the American version of Baghdad Bob and being out there and pretending that Rome's not burning behind them, <laughs> um, you know, to use a different analogy. Um, but, you know, these are people whose credibility is going to be completely shot after this campaign um, from repeating the talking points that are you know, sort of part of a different reality that exists in Trump Tower. The Trump adult children continue to demonstrate that they learned all of their values from Donald Trump directly. Uh, maybe their mothers had no impact on them at all. Uh, let's listen to Eric Trump describing what he sees as his father's courage in the debate. It would have been very easy for him to take the bait, um, especially when that last question where they asked about sexism and, and other things. I mean, he very well could have looked down, and, and he said it when he came off the debate stage. You know, I, I wasn't going to respond to that question um, because I saw Chelsea in the front row, and, and I just wasn't going to go there out of respect for her. There were a lot of people who came up to me, including many in the media, who said, listen, he could have just crushed her on that last question. You know, you would have probably heard a family if he did. And, um, I don't know. I, uh, you know, I, I think that took a lot of uh, courage in so many regards, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think he really um, answered that well and, and took the high ground and, uh, and, and kept the high road. Uh, David Korn, uh, Donald Trump has obviously taught his sons uh, precisely how he defines courage. I can't imagine. I really can't imagine, Lawrence, the type of bubble that they live in for Eric Trump to think that that sentence makes sense. It takes courage for Donald Trump not to talk about somebody else's extramarital affairs and infidelities, for Donald Trump not to do that? Has Eric Trump not looked at the family history? Has he not come back and found the stories when Donald Trump pretended to be somebody else, a spokesman, bragging about his sexual prowess with a, with a mistress? I mean, it's just... It's bizarre. Last night, well, two nights ago, you know, at the at the debate, I, General Flynn told me that Donald Trump is the most honest man in American politics. I don't know what planet these people are living on. Uh, we're out of time for this segment now, but I just want to note that Donald Trump shamed Eric Trump's mother by carrying on a public affair in the city of New York while still married to Eric Trump's mother something that Eric Trump apparently uh, thought was courageous, I guess. Katie Packer, we're going to have to leave it there for tonight. Thank you very much for joining. All right, so yeah, I think that uh, this debate is probably going to be the beginning uh, of the end.